Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School here for ACC.org. And I'm super excited to be joined by Dr. Kim Eagle, our editor in chief for ACC.org from the University of Michigan. And Dr. Gabriel Steg from Hôpital Bichat and the University of Paris here to discuss all the neat stuff going on here in Amsterdam at ESC 2020. And we're here in Amsterdam. Actually, we're not really here in Amsterdam. We're all in our offices, but uh, we'd like to be in Amsterdam, but because of the pandemic, we can't. So we are reporting to you virtually. And we'll start off with inflammation. Inflammation is hot and colchicine is part of that story. Gabriel, do you wanna tell our audience what's going on from day one as far as colchicine? There were some updates from the Colcott trial and additionally the COPS trial. Yes, there continues to be a lot of action around colchicine because it's an attractive drug. Uh, we know it very well. We've used it for a long time. It's cheap. It's really accessible. And there was intriguing results from the Colcott uh, trial last year showing some benefit in patients post-ACS treated with colchicine, although they were in part driven by a reduction in ischemia-driven revascularizations uh, and admissions. And um, there were more analyses were presented during the first day at ESC. Uh, one pertained to genetics, and I won't get into this because I, I don't think it was that impressive. Uh, but the other one was really interesting. It was an analysis that looked at uh, whether there was a difference in the benefit of colchicine given at a low dose uh, to patients, uh, regard, re depending on whether they were treated early or late uh, in the trial uh, after their symptoms. And what emerged from this is that patients who receive treatment early appear to derive a larger benefit from colchicine, indicating that maybe there's something there that's, that's really worthwhile, having a cheap, well-known drug that can be repurposed to treat inflammation post-ACS and avoid a substantial number of uh, adverse cardiovascular events with a reasonable tolerance. Actually, was pretty well tolerated. So that was the first piece of action regarding colchicine. Another trial, uh, a different trial called COPS, was also presented during day one. Uh, that trial is a, a smaller trial from Australia, or between seven and 800 patients. And that trial did not show a benefit of colchicine uh, in reducing cardiovascular events in patients with stable coronary artery disease. The, in, with ACS, I'm sorry, these are patients with ACS. Uh, the interesting thing uh, is that somewhat to the surprise of the investigators, I guess, there was an, an, an increase in all-cause mortality and in non-cardiovascular mortality. So this would appear to go in the wrong direction and to be somewhat discordant with previous observations. And we're all looking forward to more information regarding colchicine further during the meeting with the presentation of the LODOCO2 trial. Yeah, absolutely. So stay tuned for day three, where we'll see what LODOCO shows. And uh, there's also another trial out there of clear synergy that the folks at McMaster are heading up there. So there is one large ongoing trial not being presented here. I should mention I chair the DSMB of that particular trial. So that's the colchicine story for now. Maybe I could just add to that, Deepak. The, oh, yeah, please if, do. If, if you look at Colcott, there is, there is a similar but disturbing trend in the same direction that the, the non cardiac mortality in Colcott. There, the trend line is in the wrong direction in terms of whether that drug is effective. So we really do need to see what the trial comes out on. I, I believe it's going to be on Monday, and and see if this is a theme. You know, we're reducing inflammation. We might also be reducing other things that are beneficial to human health. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective, Kim. Right, inflammation exists for a purpose, and uh, maybe too much is bad in the context of an ACS, but. Perhaps yeah. in other situations, we need whatever those inflammatory pathways are doing. Well, great discussion. Uh, let's move on now to evaporate. Uh, and maybe I'll uh, do that one. And that is a study that's also being published simultaneously in the European Heart Journal. I should mention I'm a co author on that. Uh, the trial was presented by Dr. Matt Budoff as a late breaker here at ESC. He presented the nine month results as a late breaker at the American Heart Association, you may recall, and that was also just published in Cardiovascular Research, EHJ's basic science uh, journal. And basically, what Evaporate is um, it's a mechanistic study looking at icosapentafol, four grams a day, same dose and drug is used and reduce it. 
And here the goal was to see on CT angiography just how plaque might respond to the drug. So the nine month interim data, pre-specified interim data at AHA showed that multiple different components of plaque and plaque volume were favorably influenced by cosapentethyl, but the primary endpoint wasn't actually met, low attenuation plaque. Uh, now we see in Dr. Budoff's presentation here at ESC, that primary endpoint was handily met. That is a significant difference in the primary endpoint. And indeed, all the different components of plaque volume and plaque composition were significantly reduced by large amounts as far as C2 angio-defined plaque goes. And uh, the calcification, the p-value was a little bit uh, on the border for, for calcified plaque, but everything else, pretty robust p-values. And in the context of imaging studies, I would say pretty large uh, alterations, uh, beneficial changes. In fact, icosapentethyl was slowing down uh, plaque progression, which is not easy to do, especially in higher risk patients with atherosclerosis. So, you know, bottom line is it's really strong, I think, mechanistic confirmation of what was going on in Reduce It and does echo what we just saw in Reduce It Rebast, which was presented as a late breaker at Sky, showing that even by 11 months in that randomized double blind placebo controlled trial with independent adjudication of endpoints, that revascularization was already reduced. So a significant reduction in revascularization by just 11 months in that, in that large outcome trial. So the two studies, one a large outcome trial, reduce it, one a mechanistic study, evaporate, really uh, line up, I think, perfectly. So it, it makes for a nice story. But you know, I'd be interested, since the two of you are seeing this for the first time now, what your thoughts are. So certainly from my point of view, Deepak, the the REDUCA trial is you know, one of the most important additions to our therapies in the last several years. And those who were um, reticent to believe, I guess, in the, the effect that was seen, which is substantial and grows over time, have to be impressed that the mechanistic studies are very consistent with the benefits that we're seeing in humans. And, uh, and this just, I think, verifies that we should be confident that this is a real effect uh, and we should be using this agent a lot. And Gabriel, you were, of course, involved with helping lead the reduce the trial. What are your thoughts about evaporate? Well, what I like is that it, it you know, side by side, they build quite an, an, a compelling story because now we have plaque changes with the same regimen over a relatively modest period of time. Uh, we have the clinical benefits that are apparent in reduce it. And there was one piece of information which I found of great interest in Evaporate, which is that they looked at plaque progression relative to the placebo arm and compared it to uh, historical controls because there was all this discussion about the placebo arm and reduce it. And essentially the, the message is that there is no effect on plaque of the placebo. So all the discussion about the placebo uh, effect in reduce it, I think just disappears once you see the results of Evaporate. And I think that these three things side by side start to make a very compelling story. Yeah, I think those are some really great insights. Now let's move on to a series of trials. They, they all begin with E, Emperor, Explorer, and East. And, and we've got to get through them uh, quickly here. Let's start off, maybe Kim, I think of you as the emperor of ACP.org. So maybe you should do Emperor. So uh, Emperor Reduced uh, is, a, is another study looking at uh, the benefit of these diabetes agents. This is a uh, Empagliflozin in patients with heart failure and reduced EF, uh, looking at 16-month uh, outcomes of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations. And, and really, one of the key questions of this trial was, does the drug work in non-diabetics? Uh, and overall, there was a significant benefit in reducing the primary endpoint. And a similar range of benefit was seen uh, both in the patients who had established diabetes and those who didn't. Uh, so increasingly now we have to think about the SGLT2 inhibitors and, and other agents as, as the purview of cardiovascular specialists. Uh, I was impressed by the trial. The other thing that was interesting is that the renal dysfunction appeared to also go in favor uh, of using this agent. So not only are we seeing heart failure outcomes improve, uh, potentially death improve, but also renal dysfunction may improve, particularly in the diabetic patients. Yeah, no, it's more great data for SGLT2 inhibitors, including outside of diabetes and those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Bunch of trials going on looking at heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So, you know, the data keeps uh, growing. Uh, Gabriel, any thoughts about that one? 
Yeah, uh, you know, it's starting to build quite a compelling story again regarding SGLT2 inhibitors and, uh, and um, uh, heart failure uh, in patients with or without diabetes with DAPA-HF. What's interesting is that the population here with slightly greater risk, slightly more severe than DAPA-HF, but the results are really essentially consistent. Uh, the, the relative reductions are quite in the same range, so that overall, of course, because the population is a little more severe, the absolute benefit is slightly greater. Uh, but to me, there's a great consistency between the trials rather than uh, minor differences. And so I think the class is really interesting for these patients. And uh, it's clearly no longer a diabetes story. I think now it's really truly becoming a cardiology class of agents. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally with you both. I mean, in terms of heart failure, in terms of renal dysfunction, in terms of even CVNL cause mortality as a class, these drugs, I think, have a pretty profound effect. And I think cardiologists really need to get on board with prescribing these medicines, not just sort of being aware of the data. Well, we better move on to the next trial. Maybe uh, we'll go to you, uh, Gabriel, on EAST and AF. Yeah, that's an interesting topic. Um, you know, we had several years ago, the AFFIRM and RACE trials that looked at what is the uh, best option for managing atrial fibrillation, whether we should try rate control or rhythm control. And essentially the trials showed no major difference in outcomes long-term. Uh, but uh, I have to say that my electrophysiology colleagues have always been very disappointed with these results and never true believers. And they were always convinced that there must be some benefit in rhythm control. And East AF is a German uh, funded trial that's, that's actually done in several countries in Europe. And it's looking again at the question of rhythm control versus what they call usual care. Not totally rate control, but it's uh, uh, rhythm control only for uh, management of uh, AF-related symptoms. And it's a substantial uh, trial, 20, 2,800 patients. And these patients are enrolled in the first year after the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So these are recent atrial fibrillation. And when you focus on this population, well, there appears to be a benefit to rhythm control. In fact, the trial was stopped for efficacy after five years of follow-up and showed benefit of early rhythm control compared to usual care um, with a 21% reduction in the composite of a, a CVDS, MI, um, stroke, or worsening of heart failure. It was actually ACS rather than MI. Um, so I think that maybe it was all a matter of not, not waiting too much for the AFib to be permanent before you intervene. And we've always known that AF begets AF. And the more you wait, and the, the more chronic the condition is, the harder it is to reverse. So um, East AF might change practice by uh, uh, inducing uh, cardiologists to intervene early after AF uh, diagnosis to maintain rhythm. Yeah, I, I think it probably will because it sort of confirms what many believe. You know, Kim, uh, you're responsible for the shop at U of M. Uh, what are you going to tell your electrophysiologists in terms of what they should do now? Well, I, I agree with Gabriel. I think that previously we we sort of felt that AFib complicated by symptoms of heart failure and or reduced ejection fraction, we definitely want to move to rhythm control. But in patients who didn't have that, it was less clear. This certainly does support the notion of that electrical remodeling is probably not permanent if you get at these patients earlier. Uh, so I, I think this will probably change practice somewhat. Uh, and uh, I agree with Gabriel on his comments. Terrific. So Kim, maybe you can uh, bring us home now with the Explorer HCM study. Uh, I thought a really fascinating mechanism of action. So uh, what do you think? You're, you're also, I'd say, uh, our explorer among the team. You're always uh, going <laughs> off to different places uh, with your fishing pole and uh, exploring. Uh, yeah, growing up in Yellowstone makes you an explorer. So this is, in, in my opinion, the jewel of the ESC meeting. It's a study of uh, a drug called Mevacamptan. Uh, it's a first in class uh, myosin inhibitor, and it was used in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a randomized trial. Uh, in about 250 patients, followed for a year or so, a little less than a year. Beautifully done study, looked at uh, heart failure class and also peak VO2 and gradients. Um, and this drug, carefully titrated up over a matter of uh, weeks, uh, showed a substantial benefit in reducing heart failure class, uh, resting gradient peak VO2 in the patients who got the agent. 
And when titrated carefully, appear to be relatively safe. Obviously, if you're inhibiting myosin, which affects myosin, myosin actin uh, binding, you could go too far and potentially put patients into heart failure. And this trial, of course, was worried about that. So they carefully titrated the patients up over time. Um, and actually, you know, the, the average gradient, I think, in this trial at rest was 50. Um, and a third of the patients who received the mevacamptan therapy ended up with no gradient and uh, heart failure class one. Uh, so this is a really game-changing trial, I think, in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients who have symptoms and significant gradients. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, Gabriel, any uh, final thoughts before we wrap up here? Yeah. You know, I think it's a great one of the great triumphs of biology-driven uh, pharmacologic intervention uh, because it's all based on uh, truly uh, in, on true insights into the biology of the disease uh, by uh, great scientists. What I also like is that they could have done the trial looking solely at gradients, but uh, you know, gradients are one thing, but you're not treating gradients, you're treating symptoms or outcomes. And I think I liked that the primary outcome was actually looking at functional outcomes and that they showed improvement in the functional outcomes. So again, you have quite a nice story in this trial of improving the gradients, improving uh, function, improving patient's quality of life, as well as the biomarkers that all went in the right direction. And the effect is quite spectacular, I have to say. So for a condition for which we essentially had no treatment except maybe surgical intervention or ablation with alcohol, which is with the benefits of which are still discussed, I think this is quite impressive. I, I was really, really blown away by this. Yeah, I'm with you both. I think it really is practice changing and amazing science really behind it all. Well, uh, better wrap things up, I guess. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Deepak Bhatt here for ACC.org with my good friends, Dr. Kim Eagle and Dr. Gabriel Steg. Uh, this is day one in our wrap up of ESC, but stay tuned for further wrap ups. We're gonna do this every day. And also just tune into acc.org. We've got clinical trial summaries, journal scans, news stories, everything that's worth reporting from ESC. We've got it up there essentially in real time. Take care, everyone, and stay safe.